So this lecture talks about uh, hyperthreading, which is also known as simultaneous uh, multithreading. So, so far we have uh, looked at techniques that improve uh, instruction level parallelism in the form of uh, out of order execution and, and, and speculative execution with multiple issue and then uh, with better schedulers, uh, the ILP can actually become uh, very high. But uh, there are applications which are mostly operate on uh, data and then even if they operate on uh, large amount of data, the operations are uh, more or less the same. For, for example, if we are uh, doing a matrix uh, addition, so the operation is actually addition, uh, although uh, it's on a uh, different part of a matrix. So in this cases, uh, I, although ILP will be able to improve by scheduling the instructions properly, it would be better if we can exploit the data level parallelism. And to exploit data level parallelism, the concept that we will look into uh, in today's lecture is the notion of thread. And when I say thread, it's actually a hardware thread, not a software thread. So a hardware thread, uh, you can assume it's a, a program counter, register state, and then everything that is needed uh, for, for a particular uh, program uh, for an execution, like similar to what we have discussed so far in the entire course. But now we can assume there are like multiple of such uh, instances that are active at a given point of time. So the goal is to perform similar or same operations, but on a large amount of data. And so now we need the mechanisms through which our uh, front end of the processor and then the, even the entire pipeline should be able to handle uh, multiple threads in one go so that we can able to uh, extract uh, data level parallelism at the hardware level. So when we talk about thread level parallelism, basically the goal is to improve the performance of what is called the multi-threaded programs. So when uh, you are solving a task using multiple threads at the software level, which are mapped to, uh, uh, eventually they are mapped to multiple hardware threads, uh, then only uh, this, this uh, Thread level parallelism will come into picture. Otherwise, if you are running independent programs which are sequential, uh, there, is, there is no notion of data sitting among threads, then uh, there is no point of thread level parallelism. So, uh, multi threading in hardware is actually a concept where there are multiple hardware threads uh, that share a different functional units either by overlapping or, or you know, we are uh, duplicating the resources. Right, so uh, it's a design uh, trade-off whether to uh, overlap uh, accesses from multiple threads for a given functional unit or uh, to duplicate our functional unit. Uh, so depending on the trade-off, depending on the area budget, energy budget, power budget, and then the overall uh, performance improvement, uh, this trade-off decision should be made. Right, and since it is hardware-based uh, uh, multi-threading, uh, the Thread switching is actually uh, much faster uh, compared to what you have learned from your OS course. So you won't be waiting for like microseconds or so. Uh, we, are, we are still in the hardware zone. We are still de dealing with uh, uh, nanoseconds, right? So uh, with that, uh, let's, let's look at some of the hardware multi-threading approaches. And uh, that decides uh, to improve thread level parallelism but the decisions should be taken in such a way that all the threads are kind of uh, getting a fair share of resources so that no one is getting penalized. So the first way of uh, providing uh, multi-threading or hardware multi-threading is a fine-grained uh, multi-threading where multiple threads, uh, they use the entire processor pipeline, uh, but there's a round robin scheduler that comes into picture and that switch threads every clock. So we can assume that in clock zero, thread zero fetches something, let's say in clock one, thread one fetches something. Assuming it's a SMT processor with two threads. Okay, it's a two-way SMT processor. So similarly, if you have a four-way SMT processor, you will have uh, two more threads. Each of them will have their own uh, PCs and then uh, 
they, they will enter into the pipeline at uh, uh, different cycle numbers right so the positive side of uh, th this kind of switching it's it can hide all kind of stalls both short and long stall so uh, what i mean uh, by long stall is let's say if you're getting a last level cast miss so nothing to worry uh, uh, because you are kind of switching after every clock cycle even if this thread is kind of waiting for hundreds of cycles other threads can uh, keep on uh, continuing right depending on the round robin uh, scheduler right um, the disadvantage is uh, it slows down uh, the uh, like performance or uh, the execution time of individual threads uh, since uh, it can happen that even if a particular thread is ready uh, and then there is uh, no stalls for that particular thread but it has to wait so for example let's say uh, thread t3 uh, it's already all the resources uh, or uh, data dependencies are uh, completely uh, taken care of. but just to respect the order of uh, round robin scheduler it has to wait for t0 t1 and t2 then it will get it done and it will uh, fetch instructions uh, depending on the fetch width and then it has to wait again to get its turn right so this this is uh, unnecessary uh, waiting time for if you look at from the individual threads uh, perspective the other extreme is uh, known as the coarse grained where we don't switch uh, on every cycle right instead what we do is we switch uh, the threads only on the costly uh, penalties like uh, uh, l2 cast misses or lc cast misses right so this is a good approach where uh, you, you kind of continue with one thread only when you get uh, a costly miss then only you switch your thread the problem with uh, this approach is it cannot eliminate shorter stalls so stalls let's say which are less than 10 cycles or so because you your uh, switching strategy is you will switch to another thread only when there is a cost limit right so there is a trade off between um, the initial uh, startup cost that happens uh, after you you switch and uh, whatever cycles you are able to uh, mitigate right so th this trade off uh, should be taken care of wh while deciding whether to go for a coarse grain approach or not because the startup overhead will be high uh, and then uh, it won't be able to take care of all kinds of stalls so it, depending on the applications depending on the memory footprint it may or may not be a good approach uh, the last approach which is uh, no, known as the simultaneous uh, multi-threading or hyper-threading approach by the way i used the notion of smt in the uh, previous uh, slides also uh, that is just to uh, make a point that we are dealing with multi-threading okay so even if uh, they are actually not exactly smt uh, that that was an example to show that uh, we are dealing with multiple threads in uh, one clock cycle so in the smt or hyper-threading uh, approach which is actually currently implemented in commercial machines so here what happens is we kind of duplicate uh, many functional units so for example your uh, ROB, right, and then your different uh, queues that we have discussed, uh, different kinds of uh, logic that that comes into the processor, right, and it it provides an illusion that uh, we are executing multiple threads in uh, one go. So remember, we are dealing with out of order processors. So, so as long as all, all these threads. Uh, can can uh, execute and then there is no dependency so uh, there is no uh, issue from the execution point of view right? the execution stage will be more than happy to execute as long as the functional units are available but you have to make sure that the other functional units are uh, uh, there so that we can exploit uh, uh, this particular uh, uh, hyper threading or simultaneous multi-threading right so uh, this is the idea where you will find that uh, multiple threads are actually in action uh, and then so you will find uh, circuitries or uh, logic that allows uh, this particular idea 
So you you can have uh, duplicate uh, functional units or duplicate resources. For example, if you want to go for register renaming, you can have uh, per thread renaming table, right? And uh, you can also have per thread uh, reorder buffer, right? So in this way, uh, multiple uh, threads can actually go uh, concurrently into the processor pipeline. And since they are dealing with uh, other resources, uh, which are already isolated, there is nothing to be worried of. Only thing is the execution units should be free for their execution, okay? So this is a typical uh, example from um, Intel SMT. So you can see uh, some of the resources are kind of uh, partitioned and some of the uh, resources are duplicated. So for example, if uh, these are the threads which are going into uh, the uh, pipeline, uh, you, you can find that see reorder buffer is kind of duplicated, uh, store buffer is duplicated, right? The queues are also here duplicated. But if you look at the L1D cache, uh, this is shared by both the threads. And then there is no um, uh, rigid partitioning here. And similarly, this is the execution unit where both the threads are uh, going through the out of order execution, uh, as long as there is no dependency within their uh, accesses, uh, not, not across threads, okay? And so uh, that's how it is. So you can actually, uh, issue multiple instructions from uh, multiple threads, uh, but you have to make sure that you have sufficient resources in the form of queues, tables, and your buffers. And then finally, it will uh, improve our uh, throughput because now multiple threads are performing uh, same or similar job with with a different amount of data. So with that, I will stop here. Thank you.